Hey guys, today we are comparing two of the potential best options for a compact video camera or an entry point into shooting video. We've got the iPhone 13 Pro over here and the Sony ZV-1 over here. So which is going to be the best option for you for vlogging, filmmaking, cinematic B-roll and anything like that? Unfortunately, the answer isn't straightforward. Both cameras have a lot of features and indeed the iPhone is kind of four cameras in one. In fact, I believe it was Avril Lavigne who first said, why do you have to go and make things so complicated? Clearly a prophecy around this future Apple versus Sony face-off. But don't worry, because we are gonna cut out the complexity and get to clearly and compellingly communicated conclusions on everything you need to know. So let's pass to Future Dave for an overview. Everything we will cover is listed with timestamps in the description along with related product videos and affiliate links. Now, if you click on one of those affiliate links and buy something, I guarantee a 10% reduction in your risk of avocado related injuries. The settings used in all of our test footage are shown on screen now. Wherever possible, I've matched things between the iPhone 13 Pro and the ZV-1, so the differences that you're seeing are driven by the cameras themselves rather than anything else. And of course, if you enjoy the video, then like, subscribe, let me know your questions or thoughts down in the comments. But right now, let's talk about core features. We will start with the ZV-1, as things here are a bit simpler. We have a single zoom lens ranging from 24 millimeters to 70 millimeters with an aperture of f1.8 to f2.8. In contrast, the iPhone has four cameras. I'm not going to read all the specs of all of them. Instead, I'll show you a summary on screen. In total, you get a 13mm to 77mm focal range, with apertures ranging from f1.5 to f2.8. Although video crop means the actual field of view will be slightly tighter than those focal length numbers. Additionally, because the iPhone focal range is actually made up of several different lenses, the quality of that entire focal range can be lower if you have a shot that falls between lenses. That is because, unlike the ZV-1, you're looking at a digitally cropped image for those in-between points rather than the native results of a real physical lens. However, the iPhone does have the advantage when it comes to frame rates, supporting up to 4K 60 frames per second on all four of its cameras and slow motion up to 240 frames per second with audio on all of the rear cameras. Right now, let's talk about field of view and the results you can actually get with all those focal lengths. This is the main wide lens of the iPhone 13 Pro and the wide end of the lens 24mm on the Sony ZV-1. And handheld at arm's length like we are right now, they're okay for vlogging, it's definitely doable but they might be a little bit too tight for your taste. However, add a simple grip extension like the Gorillapod that we're using right now and suddenly I think you've got a really nice wide vlogging view while still having an overall light, compact and easy to use setup and a surprisingly loud bird. Now, this wide view also works well for general environment shots, scene setting, and it can be good for landscapes and architecture too. Now, like the sad fate of my waistline during the pandemic, let's get ultra wide. On the iPhone 13, we're using the 13 mil equivalent ultra wide camera, and on the ZV-1, we've attached the Ulanzi wide angle lens, which is a very nice accessory you'll find a full review of here. This is pretty much the widest view you can expect to get in video with both of these cameras. And on the ZV-1, I think it works really nicely for vlogging. For my taste, the iPhone 13 Pro is actually a little bit too wide. Still, it's getting into that fisheye GoPro type territory. But if you like the aesthetic, it's a great option. Plus, generally, both of these wide views can be great for landscapes, architecture, and anything else where you re yeah, anything else where you need to misspeak like an idiot while capturing a wide, expansive view. Nice. At the opposite end of the zoom spectrum, we have the telephoto camera on the iPhone 13 Pro and the fully zoomed in look on the Sony ZV-1. This can be nice for getting closer to your subject, a debatable move if your subject looks like this, and can also work well for talking head type setups. You also get more emphasis on your subject and less on your background, which can be pleasing and work very well for close up or detailed shots. Although the telephoto lens of the iPhone 13 Pro has very little bokeh in the image, so it's not typically as attractive as the result zoomed in with the ZV-1.
I do also notice a drop in quality when using the telephoto or ultra wide cameras on the iPhone, unlike the consistent quality across the entire range of focal lengths that you get with the ZV-1. Plus, if you want to shoot yourself with the telephoto iPhone lens, it is a bit of a nightmare to try and ensure you get good results. And that's a bit of a theme with the iPhone that we will cover more broadly later in user experience. But if you want to shoot yourself, maybe the front facing camera is better. Well, it's certainly easier. Being able to see yourself, even if you have the misfortune of looking like this, is clearly much better when you're vlogging. Plus, you get the benefit of a slightly wider angle on the front-facing camera compared to the main rear camera. Combine that with a grip extension, you can get a fairly expansive view. But these benefits come at a price. Just like the telephoto and ultra-wide cameras, our front-facing camera has a much smaller sensor which means lower quality in general and a particularly noticeable quality difference when conditions get trickier. So that's a quick summary of field of view, but what else is important for getting good video results? Stabilization is important, whether that's just for simple handheld shots or for vlogging like this. And it is an area where I'm expecting the iPhone to have a significant advantage. You see smartphones in general and iPhones in particular have had stabilization that's been significantly better than most dedicated cameras for several years now. And with the iPhone 13 Pro, Apple has OIS in lens stabilization on the wide and telephoto lenses, as well as an additional sensor shift stabilization on the main wide lens. So I'm expecting good things. But how about on the ZV-1? And here things are like Neapolitan ice cream because we get three flavors of stabilization with the ZV-1. What you're seeing now and what you'll see for most of the video is the one that I think is best, Catalyst Browse Stabilization. There's full detail on that in a couple of videos linked in the description, but the short version is the camera records gyroscopic data, and then when you do post-production, you can stabilize the video clips, get really nice smooth results, and control how much the image gets cropped into. But that is an extra workflow process, which might not be ideal, so what else have you got, ZV-1? The answer is Active Steady Shot, which, like my pickup lines, gives you moderately smooth but not great results. This, however, does get everything done in camera, and I think that Active generally works well enough that you could use it in most situations, but I think it's not as good as Catalyst or the iPhone stabilization options. So, what about flavor number three, which is Standard Steady Shot? Now, this has a small advantage compared to Active Steady Shot, Catalyst Browse, and the iPhone stabilization because it doesn't crop into your image at all. However, the stabilization results themselves are markedly worse. I wouldn't recommend vlogging with this unless you have content aimed at people with a motion sickness fetish. Now, I'm not going to judge, but it can still be useful for simple handheld shots like pans and tilts because it preserves a bit more of that human organic handheld quality, which can work really well in certain situations. Another source of that organic feel is bokeh. Our own eyes naturally blur out things that we aren't focused on, so a camera that can do the same tends to give you results that look more attractive and cinematic. But when it comes to catching Pokemon, the ZV-1 has the advantage, with a much bigger sensor than any of the iPhone cameras, alongside a wide aperture f1.8 lens, you'll get a nice but moderate background blur in vlogging situations. And if you use things like zoom compression or close focus, you can get really excellent looking bokeh results. There's a guide and lots more examples of what you can do with ZV-1 bokeh linked in the description. But what about that fancy new cinematic mode on the iPhone 13 Pro? This uses software to create fake bokeh, or as I like to call it, faux care. And if you're wondering what the faux care I'm talking about, keep looking at these examples. When you set the iPhone software to its widest aperture, a full frame equivalent f2.0, you can absolutely get more blur than the ZV-1 and some genuinely really attractive results. Plus, being able to change that aperture and therefore the amount of blur after recording is some really nice flexibility. However, like Kim Kardashian, there is a very big but that comes with that. You see, cinematic mode is limited to 1080p resolution. That is one quarter of the 4K resolution the ZV-1 gives you while achieving its bokeh. For any maths fans out there, yeah! maths. Even worse, the cinematic mode is limited to 30 frames per second only, at least right now. You might know that virtually all movies ever made have been shot at 24 frames per second, which is absolutely the cinematic look. 
Those two things make cinematic mode largely unusable for my preferred 4K 24 frames per second workflow. Though I can slow down the 30 frames per second footage to 80% speed, so it will work smoothly in a 24 frames per second project, but if you do that for vlogging, your audio is going to end up sounding a bit strange. This is cinematic mode slowed down to 80% original speed. Do I sound weird? Well, more than usual. And even if you prefer to work in 1080p 30 frames per second, cinematic mode still has issues with imperfect edge detection and issues around shifting focus, whether it's human subjects or something else. While the results can look great in some moments over a continuous time period, and again, a bit like Kim Kardashian, the fakeness is hard to miss. However, you might know that bokeh increases as your focus distance gets closer, and when it comes to close focus, the iPhone 13 Pro has a secret weapon, which is the macro mode, where the camera allows you to get insanely close to your subjects, achieving both some really captivating results and some nice natural bokeh. I got around 1.5 centimeters away for some shots, and in the right circumstances, the results can be incredible. But switching to macro mode isn't always super smooth if you want to move your phone towards your subject while shooting. Sometimes the camera will seamlessly automatically shift to macro mode, other times you will get a very jarring switch that will mess up your video. The other drawback is that macro mode isn't available in the slow motion frame rates of 120 and 240 frames per second. Instead here, the ZV-1 has the advantage. While achieving a slightly less impressive but still very good minimum focus distance, you'll see the figures on screen now for the native lens and using the macro part of the Ulanzi wide lens, the ZV-1 does have more consistent image quality and more attractive bokeh in macro situations. Plus, you can use the full range of slow motion and ultra slow motion along with these macro views to get some truly epic results. And that probably works nicely as a link to our discussion of slow motion in general. Both devices allow continuous shooting with audio at 1080p up to 120 frames per second, which is a nice five times slower than reality on a 24 frames per second timeline. The iPhone, however, gets continuous 240 frames per second in 1080p with audio, which is an advantage over the ZV-1, but the image quality here is definitely impacted, which really reduces usability. The ZV-1 can still shoot 240 frames per second, and in fact, even higher frame rates of 480 and even 960 frames per second, though this is without audio, and at 960 there is a definite quality drop. You're also limited to just a couple of seconds of shooting time, but since things get slowed down by up to 40 times compared to reality, that's still plenty, and you can get some spectacular results. Overall, like in many areas, the iPhone wins on convenience, but the ZV-1 wins on overall quality, which links us nicely to our next subject of image quality. And here you can, of course, make your own conclusions, but for me, as much as I've tried to like the iPhone 13 Pro's results, I just can't. For my taste, they look noticeably inferior to the ZV-1. Everything is over-sharpened in a way that screams, I shot this with a smartphone, and there often feels like a noticeable quality drop when anything other than the main wide camera is used in anything other than perfect conditions. There's barely any true bokeh with the iPhone in most situations, and despite using the same HLG color profile on both devices, I find that the iPhone's colors look less natural, less attractive, and a bit too processed for my taste. By contrast, the ZV-1 provides much more consistent image quality across the entire focal range. Nice, natural bokeh, which ranges from pleasant and modest through to beautiful, bountiful blurriness. Plus, all shooting features are available at all focal lengths, unlike with the iPhone. For my taste, the ZV-1 colors also seem much closer to reality, and the lack of artificial sharpness in the image looks much more pleasing and cinematic. That gap in image quality, just like the risk of being attacked by a vampire or Scientologist, becomes more and more severe as things get darker. Low light for cameras is a bit like presenting an alternative viewpoint to a social justice warrior, sure to cause high levels of stress and potentially messy results. Now there are two ingredients to good low light performance. The first is a wide aperture, and both cameras do 
have this, but it's the second which is the real secret source, and that is a large sensor size. This is the reason that the ZV-1 typically performs much better in low light than the iPhone, because of that larger sensor. And this is true across noise, autofocus, image quality, you name it. Finally, I see what all those spam emails telling me that size mattered must have been talking about. The iPhone can achieve results that look okay at times, but it's rare to get anything better than that and more common to get results that look noisy, low quality and sometimes unusable. I mentioned the superior low light autofocus of the ZV-1, but what about autofocus performance more generally? Well, performance on the ZV-1 is great. You can find more in the long-term review I did as well as the various camera comparisons, but the short version is that the focus system allows eye tracking in video and it will stick with you exceptionally well in good light. The iPhone is no slouch either and does a consistently good job in good light, but given that none of the cameras have much natural bokeh or depth of field outside cinematic mode, pretty much everything is in focus all the time anyway. However, the ZV-1 really does take the win here because not only do I find its focus works better in most situations, but you also get more control over focus speed, allowing for nice rack focus shots like this, as well as touch tracking, where the focus system will actively follow your target after you tap on it. Now, let's go from that one example of touch tracking experience to the bigger topic of user experience overall. And while neither device is perfect, both are pretty easy to use if you want to just pick up and shoot with everything on auto. However, if you want to do anything more advanced over time or have fine control to shoot more creatively or in trickier situations, the ZV-1 is a better user experience. Having physical controls and an articulating flip screen make quickly and easily controlling your settings, being able to see yourself while shooting or shooting at high or low angles a much smoother experience. If you're interested in vlogging or any kind of content creation where you shoot yourself, the inability to see yourself on the iPhone while using that best rear camera is continuously frustrating. By now, maybe you're liking the sound of one device more than the other. But on the topic of sound, we should talk about audio. You've already heard several examples earlier in the video, but it's time for a direct side-by-side -side comparison. And you're hearing the Sony ZV-1, which Sony markets as having a particularly good mic for a camera, a built-in three capsule directional mic, which is supposed to be particularly good at separating voices. I'll tell you about the iPhone in a second, but first, and the iPhone's what you're hearing right now. Here's half a coconut in the middle of a field with a free snail. Interesting to see how the cameras do focusing on that. Uh, very random. Let's hope I don't have any diseases now. And while you've been hearing me, with those great concerns, you've been listening to the iPhone 13 Pro. And Apple don't market any specific kind of amazing features of the mic, but historically they've always been pretty decent in my experience. So which do you think sounds better? So from coconuts to conclusions, what can we summarize from all of this? Well, first, if you have enjoyed the video, then please do check out the affiliate links, like, subscribe, leave a comment. All these things are a massive help, and these videos, especially this one, take a long time to make, so I really do appreciate the support. Now, second, I'll boil things down to this. The iPhone does a lot more than just video. If you're looking for a smartphone that can do very nice video in the right circumstances, and you can deal with the pitfalls that we've mentioned, it is a good choice. The ZV-1 does far fewer things than the iPhone, but as you would hope, it does a significantly better job of being a video camera. It is a pocket powerhouse for beginners, capable of great quality shots, but it can also be a gateway drug to the world of videography, just like it has been for me. So I'd pick up the ZV-1 if, like me, the experience and quality you get from shooting with a smartphone feels too limiting. Otherwise, the iPhone can do well in lots of situations, and if you like how the footage looks and can avoid those trouble spots we covered, it may suit you well. But what do you think? You've heard my views and in fact listened to me all the way to the end of the video. Massive thank you for that. So let me know, but more importantly, until next time, take it easy. But. What about that fancy new cinematic mode on the iPhone 13 Pro? Apparently shaking things means they're fancy now, so earthquakes, very fancy.